Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox yet again. This is lesson five of the first unit of the Big Data Applications and Analytics course. Uh, this is part of the Indiana University School of Informatics and Computing Data Science curriculum. Uh, I'm going through details of units in this, um, in this course. Remember the course has sections, units, it has 33 units. And a unit is roughly uh, 30 to 60 minutes, uh, there's about 30 hours of video in all, and there's 33 units. And units are based, broken up into lessons. And this is the fifth lesson of the first unit, the introduction to the course. Course introduction, here we are. Okay, let's go for it. Well, we've given you um, two thirds of the uh, course already, because remember there, was, there are three, um, Lessons which describe the course contents, and now we um, we just to told you about the cloud parallel computing and cloud computing, and did the discussion of the last lesson. Uh, the first uh, discussion on this lesson is um, the use case of web search and information retrieval and text mining. And I say there are two units, part one and two. We do a general survey of data mining. We define the web and text search problem. We discuss uh, history of libraries and things like that. Uh, the core information retrieval technology which is actually pretty old. Some techniques like Boolean queries, fuzzy indices, the vector space. Well, I pointed out earlier that the really key idea is mapping abstract problems into spaces and. Uh, that's done here as well, and you have a, it's not necessary to do that, but one of the more powerful methods is based on that. We have a discussion of probabilistic models, and the famous um, um, discussion of frequency versus Bayes as the interpretations of probability. This is an old area, I remember reading about this when I was a, a very junior assistant professor at Caltech, uh, doing physics data analysis, I read, or at that time, all this stuff was very new, and I was uh, building my knowledge of statistics and probability for the first time. And I remember long discussions of that, and as far as I know, the situation isn't actually resolved, except Bayesian methods, which even then were known to be uh, probably the best approach, or still the best approach. Uh, we look at data analytics used in web search. In the sort of detail, we go through document preparation, forming the invited index, constructing the index, uh, how you do query structure and processing. Then we get on, this is sort of the core, very old information retrieval. A lot of the very important um, capabilities you now see come from the use of context and the joining all the information together. Um, because when you type a search, it knows who you are. It knows where you live, it knows what you do, it knows what you last did, and so you can use that to <coughs> optimize its response. And one of the things it does is link structure analysis, which is ranking, um, using the number of links uh, to a page to rank the page and things like that. And that's where page rank comes from. It was one of the founding principles of Google when it was set up. This is then summarizes the whole area of a web search, discusses how to do or build a search engine. You have to crawl the web. We have a bit of discussion of web advertising. And we return to clustering and topic models, where instead of clustering items or people together, usually in the case of e-commerce, you cluster items together because you're trying to find which items are near each other, which people might like. In the case of um, Web search, you're clustering news items, even uh, clustering items by their common content. You'll cluster all the items on Indiana University's <coughs> sports program or something like that. Now we have, remember, red denotes software. And um, we have Software for PageRank, which is offered in Python or Java. The discussion is the Python discussion. Um, then we go through uh, k-means in detail and do k-means in Python and Java, and that take a case of four artificial clusters and go through in great detail. Then we look at MapReduce, 
Um, introduce Shooter Map Produce, which was only done very, very briefly before in the uh, uh, in the motivation. And then we go to advanced topics in Map Produce about how people are extending it. And then we actually illustrate its use by applying it to k-means. Uh, and using Python, using a sort of by hand version of map reduce to illustrate the basic principles. So this is um, an example of a technology uh, part of the course. Um, you can do all of this with essentially no knowledge of Python. Oh, yeah, and you can completely ignore Java if you don't want it. There's no need to look at this in Java. And Python's actually a more elegant way of doing this part of the course. Because Java only pays off when you're doing large scale production work where the power of Java as an enterprise software environment can be seen. So, after that the technology discussion, we come back to use cases. With the first uh, use case we come to now is for many people the most interesting. Certainly for Indiana University undergraduates, the most interesting is sports informatics. In fact, you can take this particular unit earlier. This now doesn't have to be taken at this time in the in the sequence. So this has actually this section on sports informatics has three units. Uh, the first two units are on um, baseball, and also some introductory material to the general field of sports informatics. But baseball, as far as I can see, based on what's on the web at least is far more advanced in, uh, in the use of analytics and, and informatics than other fields. And it's, of course, well known to people through the movie Moneyball, which uh, is sort of basic baseball informatics or baseball analytics. And this whole area is called sabermetrics, coming from the uh, SABR uh, uh, work on uh, research in uh, Baseball uh, analytics and sabermet. We go through various sabermetric measures, both simple ones like uh, slugging and on-base percentage and stuff like that. Um, ERA for pitchers, but then we do a more advanced ones and including the so-called uh, WAR wins above replacement. We look at the the relationship between performance and dollars. And then we also go through with the really quite important uh, quantitative use of video in these uh, systems, pitch FX, field FX, hit FX, and command FX, coming from this innovative company, Sport Vision, and how you can analyze the video to extract the ball position, extract the hit of the picture, extract the motion of the field, or extract the motion of the of the catch. That's what command FX does. It's it FX obviously does the batter, and field FX the um, fielder. And so you see, baseball is advanced actually in two types of areas. It actually uses the video to do quantitative predictions, whereas in the other sports, as we'll see in the third unit, the video still exists, but it's only used for what I call spatial visualization, making pictures of where people do what on the field. So, uh, whereas on, in baseball, that video is translated into into measures like uh, speed of the fastball and whether or whether the particular pitch was a, a particular type of pitch, a slider or a fastball, for example. That was all done from the video analysis, and that is fed into sabermetrics measures as uh, and then used. Uh, derive these predictions as to the value of players, the doing a detailed analysis of which player to play when, and of course for the how much is how much you can afford to pay it, which requires this pretty interesting discussion of the relationship between dollars and performance, which is non-trivial. Uh, different teams have different relationships. It depends very much on how much money you get if you do well compared to how much money you get if you do badly. New York Yankees, that's a big factor there. For other smaller teams, it's not such a big factor. So in this third unit, we do other sports, and these are listed here, soccer, Olympics, NFL, American football, basketball, tennis, and horse racing. 
we look at wearables uh, and their application. We like for sports, uh, consumer sports. We do spatial visualization in general. And these sports are still pretty interesting application of analytics, but they have not reached the maturity of baseball. And the reason why baseball is actually ahead is partly just innovative people in the field, and also just because they're it's slightly easier to analyze in, in a precise fashion because every action in baseball often only involves one person and the ball. The pitcher throws the ball, that's just the pitcher. The batter hits the ball, the fielder runs to the ball, and the catcher catches the ball. Each of those actions can be analyzed independently and produce measures describing them, and that is um, gives you baseball informatics. Where if you play soccer, many players are milling around trying to hit the ball, and so is same is true in basketball. These multiplayer sports are much harder to analyze than there. The current analytics is just somewhat more qualitative. And now we come on to health informatics, which has advanced a lot over the last uh, couple of years since I first did these lectures. I've, I've, uh, there's been a lot of material and I've extended the, this section accordingly. Um, we have um, a dis general discussion, including the current state of healthcare in the U.S. The you know the how much the dreadful 17% of the GDP that it takes, and uh, other important issues like people living longer, or somewhat more positively, and increasing use of telemedicine or virtual interactions. That's again directly informatics. You have sensors and people at one end of a link. Doctors and analysis systems at the other end. We have a discussion from a Accenture survey of data analytics in, in the healthcare industry. We go to an example, a big cloud-based big data medical platform. This has only recently been described, and it's um, an example of the fact that uh, that only recently have some of the things that people predicted to happen started to happen. People knew you could do cloud-based big data. Medicine, but only recently has that been realized and described. <laughs> we discussed some different aspects of uh, big data in, uh, in medicine, focusing on images, because those images are a critical characteristic of, um, of medical data and actually the largest source of data at the moment, because genes are not yet, or gene sequencing is not a big effect at the moment. We look at general issues of clouds, focusing on Security for the which is critical for the health application. We go to three reports: McKinsey, Microsoft, and the European Union, which all focus on different aspects of the of healthcare. We look at a little short module on Internet of Things and healthcare. Then we have an amusing um, section from the Robert uh, Woods. Uh, Johnson Foundation, which is looking at four scenarios for healthcare in 2032. Two are positive, one is depressing, and one is middle of the road. And they sort of go through what's going on. And so actually, it's pretty interesting because a lot of what's going on implies that um, what they predict to happen implies changes in society and due to the digital revolution. The final section looks at the promise of genomics and proteomics and information visualization in this field. Uh, the next uh, section and unit is on the Internet of Things and Census. We do an overview of the Internet of Things. We look at two areas, robots and drones, with some nifty examples. And then recently, uh, the concept of the Industrial Internet of Things has been pioneered by General Electric, who. Uh, they have, for instance, established a whole software effort in the Internet of Things, and has grown from essentially zero a few years ago, three years ago, to 700 a day. When we look at clouds and their role in processing sensors and the Internet of Things. We look at an example from Polar Science, the work we do with Kansas University. We look at the general comments on smart cities. We go through some comments from Korea on the ubiquitous Korea and ubiquitous city and ubiquitous home concept. And the last set of slides discusses some issues around smart grids. These are smart electrical grids, where instrumenting with sensors, the grid can both help you monitor how you're generating the uh, and distributing the energy, and also help you to look for 
non-optimal or optimal. In fact, the usage of the energy just based on monitoring how it's used in people's homes and in their businesses. To go, which is remote sensing or radar informatics, which we described in an application we know to glaciology. And uh, it causes us all important due to global climate change. The changes now seen in the glaciers are affect strongly, are affected by global, cli by global climate change, and they also impact global climate change. Because the melting glaciers are melted by the warming temperatures. And the melting glaciers then cause the sea level to rise and all sorts of havoc to be raised. Uh, we describe some technology, remote sensing technology, uh, the science of studying glaciers, which are more formally called ice sheets, the f discussing radar overview and basics and what we're doing and how we're doing it in a collaboration with Kansas, uh, the Crisis Center. So that's uh, the last use case. Uh, we do not have a conclusion section, maybe we should, maybe I'll produce one. But uh, you can go back and read the motivation if you want to conclude, because the conclusions is the same as the beginning. We're in a revolution. This tells you some highlights of that revolution with an application orientation. So now we're almost ready to get started. This is the course overview. Hope you found it useful. This is Jeffrey Fox signing off from lesson five of unit one. Thank you.